Nicaragua, Central America. Managua. Here, as in other places of the world, there are those who hardly have any language at all. Maria Noname, Mary No Name. Deaf since birth, she has been isolated all her life, both from the people who could help her and from others with her disability. Her friend, linguist Judy Kegel, understands the depth of her isolation. The two can communicate just a little, using simple and primitive gestures. The first time I met her, she was missing the ability to tell me who she was. She was missing the ability to tell me how old she was. She doesn't know her name. In order to tell me who she was, she had to take me home and show me the papers and pictures of her family. Um, we had to share a context. She can tell me things. I can show you a bit. She can tell me what happened to her father. Hmm. I asked her about her father dying, and she said three, OK? What three meant was he was shot three times. I know this from working with the other deaf signer, that she said he was shot in three places. And that's how her father died, right? Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, but, but three is just not enough to give me access to the information that I would have needed had I not had prior knowledge about that. Papa. Papa. Okay, what she's saying is, I had a daughter that went away and got married, and that was it. She never came back. I had a son that went away, and I never heard from him again. You know, that's it. I'm alone. That's my life. She was language ready. Um, the problem was she didn't get access to language within that critical period. And that critical window for learning language in the way that we learned it is closed. This window for language remains open until we reach age seven. Then it slowly closes as we advance towards puberty. Before the 1980s, many deaf Nicaraguans were like Mary No Name. They never encountered the window for language because they never encountered others with their disability. But in 1980, after the Nicaraguan Revolution, the new government tried to enhance deaf people's lives. It brought deaf village children into Managua to end their isolation. Here, educators tried to teach them an existing sign language. The effort failed. The children showed little interest in learning a language forced upon them. Instead, they began communicating with each other in their own way. Judy Kegel was summoned from the United States to sort out the problem. I came down thinking wherever there were deaf people, there was a sign language, and that obviously there would be a, a full-blown sign language in full swing here in Nicaragua. And this, I said, well, you know, I, I can learn a bit of their sign language if that's what you want and, and work with you on learning it. They said, no, they don't have a sign language. They have, they have mimicas. They have mime gestures. And they pointed to a group of kids and said, we want to know what they're talking about. It turned out they were talking about a lot more than anyone dreamed possible. Kegel had arrived in Nicaragua shortly after the birth of a new language. Language needs company. Language needs a community. Language needs some sort of a trigger. And I think that, I think that trigger is, it's not so much that it needs a community in the sense that there have to be lots of people, but a part of being a community is wanting to share information with each other. Might this moment resemble what happened around 50,000 years ago? the turning point that led to the explosion of human creativity? Language does not need a voice. It is our legacy, an inevitability of being human. Today, 
we still don't know exactly when language evolved, when it opened the door to our phenomenal success as a species. This is a verb reduplicated. But language, every language, depends on strict rules, all of them familiar. That's a roll shift to looking at a man looking at the bird, then back to the man falling off the mountain, have dreaming that he's going to fly like a bird. While many species can communicate, even vocalize, only human languages are driven by complex rules. Every one of our world's 6,300 languages has them. We call them syntax. In her isolation, Mary No Name never encountered syntax, but it is commonplace in the children's language. Syntax isn't the set of rules that you learned in your third grade grammar that you had to memorize so you spoke English the way you're supposed to. Syntax is, or language, the constraints on language are something that all human beings share. They're the constraints that are imparted to us by the fact that we share a single human brain. They are the, not just the constraints, but the ability to hierarchically organize information that allows us to construct sentences, novel sentences that have never been said before, that allows us to, put, to, to tell a story, that allows us to prophecy, that allows us to lie. I can surely communicate for communication's sake when I have syntax, then I can truly use a language. And those most gifted with the tools of language might have been the ones to prosper, according to Richard Dawkins. We don't know when language started, but as soon as language did start, it provided an environment in which those individuals who were genetically best equipped to thrive and survive and succeed in an environment dominated by language were the ones who left the most offspring, and that probably in our forefathers that probably led to an improvement in the ability to use language. What exactly was the evolutionary purpose of language? Was it to discuss water holes, weapons, what lay over the hill? Or might it have had another advantage? 